don't forget. And uh, good morning to everyone that's, that's just dialing in, so thanks. Uh, good morning, Ravish, how are you? Hi, Rich, how are you doing? Very good. And uh, I see uh, Ken on the line. What what Ken are we? What Ken is this? Oh, I'm sorry, it's uh, Ken Johnson from Centera Healthcare. Oh, good morning, Ken. Uh, are you are you new on the call? No, I was here uh, last time. I oh, okay. I, update, I guess I should update <laughs> my name. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's well, that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> Steve, Stephen just did, did it. Uh, it yeah. Sometimes it's hard for me to track who it is because uh, I. I Usually can remember names, but not not always. But uh, anyway, well, good to have yeah, you no on. Worries. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> good to have you on. Uh, Wendy's just got on the call. Fantastic. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, and we have a Brian on the call. Uh, what Brian is that? Oh, and I, he doesn't have uh, he doesn't have doesn't look like he has a uh, a mic. So we'll get that sorted. All right. Well, so as as folks get on the call, uh, thanks. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good good evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, great to have you on uh, on this Friday. Uh, here in Seattle, it's a bit overcast and gloomy, but that's okay. Uh, that's springtime weather out here. Um, so we do have a pretty full agenda today. Uh, I do want to get started, um, and uh, as always. Uh, first thing we want to do is, is talk about antitrust with our antitrust policy for the Linux Foundation. Uh, I am sharing my screen, so you should see that, and if not, please let me know. Otherwise, there's our antitrust policy. Uh, in short, uh, it means be good to others, uh, and so, uh, but I'll urge you to read through there as far as uh, any kind of details go. Uh, and that's available as well uh, through the link, for, the full link uh, for our antitrust policy. Um, uh, going forward. Um, can I ask someone to take notes for me today, please? Oh, and this is always the fun part. If I don't hear, if I don't hear anyone volunteering, I'll start picking names. Hi, Rich. Uh, I'll take notes. Yay for Wendy. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, just very, very high level notes, Wendy. It'll just help me uh, get notes together after the meeting. So thanks, I appreciate it. And then just email me whatever notes you have. Um, okay, uh, with that said, uh, I also wanna sort of ask if anyone is new to the call, uh, new to the group, uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, anyone on the call who wants to introduce themselves to the rest of the membership? Hey, Rich. Um, I'm new to, I think, this uh, relatively new to the overall group, although this is not my first uh, meeting. Um, Go for Brian it. Bento. Yeah, so uh, my name is Brian Bento from a company called Instamed. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Yes. So, so hold that, Brian. And I don't want <laughs> to not allow you to introduce yourself. But I'm going to have you introduce yourself later on because uh, okay, perfect. You're actually in the agenda, and so I'll, I'd I'd like I'd like to have you talk more at that point if that's okay. Uh, anyone else on the call before we get started wants to introduce themselves? Okay, all right. Well, we'll get started then. Uh, so I see a lot of familiar names. It's great to see everyone. Uh, and as I said, we do have a full agenda, so I do want to get started. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so. Um, First of all, uh, I want to go through our um, subgroup updates. For those of you that may be newer to the, to the group, we have three different subgroups. Uh, the subgroups are really focus areas for this uh, special interest group in healthcare. Uh, and uh, these three subgroups are not the end all be all, which is to say that if you have other ideas or other areas of interest that you'd like to participate in, uh, I'd love to have you sort of step up and say, hey, I got an idea about uh, a work effort that we can do through this uh, special interest group. Keep in mind that we have over a thousand members in the special interest group. Uh, they, they're already sort of, as, as I describe it, pre-filtered. 
uh, with an interest and a professional background in healthcare, and of course also an interest in blockchain technologies, particularly uh, using the Hyperledger frameworks. And so, you know, with a, with over a thousand members, that's a, over a thousand resources available. We can do some pretty amazing things. So. Uh, if you don't see anything here in these subgroups that, that's particularly interesting to you and you see something else that you'd want to uh, pursue, uh, please let me know and I'm happy to facilitate. Again, we have a lot of resources on, on hand that we can put to use. So with that said, um, let's see, is Benjamin on the call? I do not see him. Um, so patient member subgroup, uh, I'll give you sort of a general overview. So their focus uh, as the name states, is interested in the payer, as uh, I'm sorry, the patient aspect of the sort of what I call the, the trilogy, which is uh, patient, payer, and provider. Uh, so it tends to be patient focused. Uh, their background and their history, they've been around for the organization, uh, that subgroup has been around for just over, just about a year or so, I'd say, uh, with a big focus in a donor milk project, which is also a hyper, uh, a hyperledger lab project. Uh, and that is looking at the, the supply chain for mother's milk uh, for, for uh, babies that are born prematurely with mothers that can't yet produce milk for their, for their child. Uh, and it's an interesting supply chain exercise. Uh, so that's part of the focus for that uh, subgroup. Uh, they're also looking at other options, other new projects uh, and other um, uh, supply chain issues uh, going forward and so I would recommend uh, that you uh, contact Benjamin uh, and the easiest way to do that would be through our rocket channel chat which is uh, through the, the, the Hyperledger uh, HC SIG uh, channel uh, and feel free to contact me or look on the wiki for details for that for connecting through rocket chat um, and they meet every two weeks. Uh, really, it's actually opposite uh, this week. So next week, Friday, I think I want to say nine o'clock uh, Pacific, they meet nine to 10. Uh, and so it's every two weeks. Um, Ravish, you want to talk about payer subgroup? Sure, Rich. <clears throat> A couple of updates. One, uh, if you remember, we've been talking about the white paper and all there earlier, but looks like we've picked up this team. So last few meetings, there have been good discussions and uh, also people have started contributing to the paper. Um, we have the paper on the Google Docs and you know, it's in the meeting um, agenda and, and notes uh, that I share. Um, Patricia, Chantel, I believe Alan, and I also got an email from John uh, Stolman. He has been a regular attendee earlier and uh, you know he had some uh, um, you know, some break time and now he's coming back and wanting to engage more on that. So, so I have, uh, uh, you know, enough, uh, I would say steam on that side. So, which is good. Uh, so it's progressing. Um, we are hoping that we will wrap up something uh, in this quarter for that. Uh, second is we also had a good discussion around starting a prototype, uh, on a use case. So that will be picking up. I have, uh, also thought about. Uh, you know, before we pick that up, I was, I've started talking to a few leaders in the area and also talked to Maryland Center for Entrepreneurship. Um, they uh, are willing to host an event of Hyperledger event, including bringing in some of the leaders in the local area to talk about Hyperledger and blockchain and healthcare. So that's, that is really recent development. I had a, literally had a discussion on Tuesday. Um, you know, after our call. So um, that's something that is coming together. I am hoping to have a physical, you know, attendance event if possible, and obviously inviting some more folks to the to the party, if you will, to work on uh, or start planning on the prototyping that we are planning to do on one use case that we, we plan to pick up. Uh, I will be sending out a communication as well on that regarding to the whole group to invite. If anyone is interested to contribute towards uh, a prototyping that we'll start working on uh, on Hyperledger fabric and you know related to healthcare pair that would be a good idea for them to join so that's where we are right now excellent and and can you sort of uh, give everyone sort of a quick summary of what what the pair subgroup does absolutely so pair subgroup is more focused from healthcare pairs perspective um, you know there is a there is a lot of interest in 
uh, a number of use cases in healthcare that may be a valid use case uh, leveraging blockchain and we focus on all our discussions related to pair and how it will facilitate adoption in pair industry um and you know last few meetings we have been um we have been able to make some good progress on the white paper that we were planning to publish and hopefully this i am hoping to wrap this up this quarter and then also kick off the the prototyping effort or some kind of poc effort just like the donor milk uh, use case i will be looking for a sponsor in the healthcare industry and that's what the that's where the you know the um, the maryland center for entrepreneurship and and their engagement with a lot of local businesses uh, including the larger companies is there so they will help promote that event and and bring in some you know people together here physically so we can you know really put some steam and steam and some sponsorship behind the use cases excellent and and when when do you meet rubish uh we meet every other tuesday uh and it's the same week of the tuesday that we meet for this um you know uh, fr- uh friday so we met this last tuesday and we will we are meeting every other uh tuesday and and at what time it's from 3 pm to 4 pm eastern standard time excellent and, and it's the same conference number and everything correct so anyone who's on the call is will and and wants to contribute they are welcome to join perfect okay thanks ravish uh and then our newest uh subgroup uh the healthcare interoperability subgroup uh which we call his <laughs> not to be sexist or anything uh steven you want to talk a little bit about that sure there hasn't been <clears throat> any substantial progress since the last meeting um we're not probably going to be well i don't have a firm date uh right now i'm really overwhelmed with uh a large contract that uh is coming to fruition uh, next weekend and not this coming weekend but next weekend and so the build out for that has uh ramped up as you can imagine quite quite heavily and uh so there's not we I, i'm hoping that in middle may we'll be able to start the meeting part of the reason that i don't want to start it sooner is because i want to make sure that we have enough uh momentum to begin to carry through uh, there's several things that we'll be doing initially which will require uh, a body of of different types of people uh clinical people uh software people um to begin to build out specifications and that's where the documentation will be coming from in this particular health group the goal here is to actually build a working uh uh hyperledger poc uh that can respond to episodes of care use cases uh and be able to put interoperable semantic data on the chain or accessible from the chain and build out the transaction policies and assets needed to do all that and and, and, and do you, just just to sort of uh you you want to give kind of an overview of the intent of the subgroup okay <laughs> I skipped that. Uh so the intent of the subgroup is to take a a different approach than most of the other groups that at least I've been involved in here and that's a bottom up approach to actually tackle the technical uh requirements and build out uh actual code and documentation that would be things like software design documents that sort of thing. uh to to actually build a hyperledger uh fabric health cha- channel uh for a consortium of health systems and individual patients uh so that we can begin to see just how we would exchange data where it's needed to be exchanged and and how it's going to be stored on a distributed ledger um so it's it's a bit of an investigation sort of a spike so to speak as we say um but we we will be actually building code and requirements from that not sure which is going to drive which i'm sure at the beginning we will drive uh, the requirements for the for the blockchain uh in documentation then as we build it out it'll circle back and feed back into those requirements 
So essentially it's to build uh, several use cases. The first one we'll probably be taking a look at will be immunization. Very simple thing uh, to, to describe uh, the use case uh, and then how that immunization, once it's been put on the blockchain, is used by the patient and by their primary care manager uh, to surface that data from the blockchain. We'll be making a lot of assumptions, uh, things like identity, um, consent management, all of those, you know, very nice things. We're going just to make assumptions, document them out, um, so that we don't get bogged down with distractions uh, to exactly how to persist or make available uh, interoperable data on the blockchain. Excellent. So. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty good. Uh, and uh, it just occurred to me as you were speaking that uh, you, you've generated a charter for this for the subgroup, and I I really ought to get it up on the wiki. And uh, so I have a note uh, to myself to get that taken care of, because I think that'll also help to inform uh, newer members uh, about what it is that you're planning to do going forward. And I think, uh, as you know, Stephen, we've gotten an awful lot of really uh, interested folks that are looking uh, forward to participating in this, uh, this subgroup. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah, and I think it'll be a great effort. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very sorry that I haven't been able to I had hoped to get this started back in March, but I uh, just became overwhelmed and just didn't want to start something that we couldn't carry momentum forward. So May looks that we're gonna try all, everything possible to get this mid-May. And yes, you're right. We've got a lot of people that have contacted us and uh, so that's, that's perfect. I don't wanna let that momentum die as well. Right, good. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Okay, and then uh, we also have teams that we put together. Uh, teams tend to be um, more, uh, well, ad hoc. I, you know, they, they, they kind of come and go, although sometimes they spin out uh, more permanent uh, uh, groups, which become subgroups. Uh, in fact, uh, the healthcare interoperability group that Stephen was just talking about was a side effect of, a, of an ad hoc team that we had put together. Um, so, uh, Ravish is on the call, and he leads the, the wiki redesign team. Um, I don't know, Ravish, if there's anything new that you want to report out for that? No, I think, uh, I, um, Rich, I don't know if there was any meeting that was set up after Dave's initial discussion. But I think uh, nothing else has come up on that. I think we've been fairly using the, the wiki, um, and I, I find it effective as well. There are some confluence features that we are not using today um, that I can definitely share um, because there are ways you can create tasks in there for the people who, you know, at least that's something that we I've been trying to do. Uh, okay. But it's not being used consistently. There are some really good features that confluence has uh, that can be effective. Okay, and yeah, I would agree. It, it's been pretty quiet uh, on this side. So, uh, in general, we, we uh, earlier this year we moved uh, we moved to Confluence from our old wiki. Uh, the old wiki is uh, is basically read only at this point. So you'll notice that up on our wiki page we have uh, some older links that uh, sort of dead end, and so we're in the process of cleaning up that transition. Uh, and then, as Ravish points out, we have a couple of uh, newer features that we'd like to to implement uh, for this SIG, and then the broader issue that Ravish was alluding to is we're trying to work with all SIGs and work groups within Hyperledger to 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 generate a, sort of a common look and feel for for membership, uh, and it's taking an awful long time it seems because uh, well part of it is uh, we're growing at such a fast rate uh, the organization uh, organization's growing at such a fast rate uh, that it's just really hard to keep keep up with things. And so uh, kudos to Ravish for helping to, to drive this. It, it just takes an awful long, uh, long time to get this stuff sort of synced up. Uh, okay, so this is really exciting. So uh, we also have an academic research team uh, that's uh, sort of come together. Uh, it was originally kicked off uh, uh, by Adrian Berg, who I don't believe is on the call this morning. Uh, Adrian uh, brought this issue up in one of these general meetings, I want to say October, September, October of last year. Uh, and so we started uh, talking and, and generated a proposal, uh, sort of a, well, sort of a proposal for where we thought this uh, research team would go. So the gist of it being, uh, in short, that um, in healthcare particularly, it tends to be um, 
driven in, in large measure by academic research and the process uh, that academia has used uh, for vetting uh, new ideas through uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers and journals. Uh, and so we wanted to find a way to, to, to sort of encapsulate that and, and generate some, some activity through this SIG for the sake of academic research. Uh, Logan, uh, so we had a great meeting, I want to say about a week or so ago. Uh, Logan, who's one of our team members, uh, put together a proposal. So thanks, Logan. Did you want to talk sort of briefly on that? Uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, just uh, would invite all feedback. There's no pride of authorship here. Um, there are several things that the paper actually talks about. Uh, one is uh, it's a it's a pivot to actually uh, talk uh, or engage academic medical centers in delivery of healthcare, actually applying blockchain and specifically smart contracts into healthcare delivery. There's, a, there's actually a checklist in there. There's an attempt at a generic um, um, care continuum model that uh, potentially can be looked at by other groups. There's also uh, within the checklist a, a look at um, who and how you can potentially drive interest in not just creating papers, but actually um, doing evidence-based medicine and, and attracting the economic uh, in interests of the, uh, of the U.S. healthcare, specifically the payers and the providers. So welcome any feedback, um, and uh, obviously I'm very happy to be part of the team. Thanks. Thanks, Logan. Uh, yeah, and I think the way forward is uh, at our last meeting, I think we're gonna do, probably get together for, for an initial meeting. Um, so if there is anyone that is on the call today that's interested in uh, getting more involved in this particular team, please let me know. And again, uh, either uh, through chat, which is a little bit difficult, but uh, more so either through email uh, or the Rocket Channel chat, um, or Rocket Chat channel. Uh, and the reason for that is, um, we're still sort of coming together with some focus on, on how best to proceed, uh, but we have a great team. I, I'm really excited. It, it's, it's, it's fun, uh, particularly for SIGs of this nature, we have folks that uh, are really, really sort of top shelf folks from all over the world that, that participate uh, and periodically we'll have uh, a group spin up and then it tends to quiesce for a while. Then it's sort of, you know, we can get another big kick of very, very good resources. And so this is a great example of where Adrian and I sort of let this uh, languish just a bit. And then we had some other great people, including Logan and Wendy uh, Nisarg as well, uh, joining the team. And we were really sort of moving this forward again with, with great momentum. So this is a very exciting group. Um, okay, well, good. And so uh, more on that going forward. Like I said, we probably have another, at least one other meeting. Uh, and in fact, we may in, end up turning this into a subgroup because of the, the enthusiasm behind it and, uh, and the interest uh, behind it. So more to come on that point. Alrighty, uh, old business. So uh, first of all, thanks to all of our subgroup leads, uh, Stephen, Ravish, and Benjamin. Uh, we have uh, a quarterly report which we're obligated to generate at a quarterly uh, interval, of course. Uh, and what that does is that tends to sort of summarize the work that's been done the prior quarter. And so uh, this is that, uh, that page, and this is uh, part of our wiki. Uh, so uh, feel free to, to parse that as appropriate. Uh, I think it's a great resource for people coming online uh, or people just just general membership that wants to get a sense for kind of where we are at a granular uh, higher level uh, quarterly level uh, but uh, thanks particularly uh, to uh, subgroup leads for helping to make this happen uh, it tends to tends to just be one of those things that you just got to get done and so we got it done uh, actually uh, in advance of our deadline which was fantastic and interestingly enough the deadline was uh, tax day here in the US and so all, all the more uh, thanks uh, to you guys for for making this happen because it just the timing was was odd um, so uh, last meeting and actually two meetings ago because our last meeting was our guest speaker uh, we had a discussion about use cases, uh, and this was really a conversation uh, that came out of uh, uh, some feedback that I received at the HIMSS conference uh, back in February, which was the, the HC SIG, uh, this group, 
uh, doesn't really have use cases documented per se. Uh, we we have some very old sort of stale use cases that are that are floating around uh, in the old wiki. Uh, but the question really was, do we want to generate use cases? Uh, and I think uh, Wendy uh, sort of uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more up, uh, about uh, sort of her insight on this because uh, she's she put together a great resource for us for the sake of research that will I think influence some of this uh, discussion. Um, but here, here's kind of what I want uh, to talk about uh, uh, this morning, which is um, I'm interested to get a sense for uh, what what people's thinking about use cases are. And, and really, sort of the, the corollary to that is, because uh, I, I have a view on this, is who would like to volunteer in this space? So, so first of all, let's, let's talk about use cases. Who sees value in it? Uh, and, and again, we, we need to sort of think about not just this, not just ourselves, because uh, we tend to be maybe uh, a little bit more uh, thoughtful or maybe progressive in understanding blockchain technologies. But I'm thinking more about people that are just sort of maybe learning about blockchain technologies in healthcare and want to maybe learn more. Uh, and part of the value I can imagine of a use case is a good example. Uh, of how to maybe implement uh, a blockchain solution in the healthcare space. Uh, but I'd like to get your, your feedback on this. So any, anyone want to just sort of jump in and, and make a comment about this? Um, I have a question first. Go for it. So when you say a use case, um, can you elaborate more? My understanding when you say use case is I'm thinking something like donor milk, which is a specific, um, you know, let's say industry, it could be a specific service or product, um, something to that extent. Is that what you mean by a use case? You know, tracking a specific product or something like that? Uh, yeah, I could be. Uh, so, you know, so that would be a good supply chain use case, the donor milk project, for example. Uh, so the feedback that we were receiving from the HIMSS conference was, and this, it just, it, to be honest, it's, it's a little odd to me, uh, but people came, would come up to us and say, well, what are your use cases for your Hyperledger projects? Uh, and, uh, and I said, well, it, as long as you sort of understand the underlying technology, there you know there are an awful lot. Uh, but in the supply chain space, uh, for example, we have and, and I go on to talk a little bit about the donor milk project. Um, so, uh, so to answer your question, yeah, the use cases are really good good examples uh, within the context of the healthcare industry that are uh, are good examples of utilizing blockchain technologies. Sure. Uh, that, so that, really sort of unambiguates uh, the question of, well, gee, why can't you use a, a traditional database, uh, you know, centralized database instead? So I think, and, and I think the rationale behind why people are interested in use cases, and this is part of the discussion point, I think, uh, is they want to have a better understanding of, of the bounds of blockchain technology and when and where uh, and, and when not to use blockchain technologies. Does that make sense? Yes, so I've been talking to quite a few folks recently um, and I've been getting questions about use cases. And to me, this, I might, perhaps I share some of your uh, maybe confusion or, you know, there's an obvious use case in healthcare, which is um, interoperability and sharing data across different providers. Um, you know, the, and I'm, I know we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, but my thought was that uh, taking the um, fire specification, which is all about you know, being able to exchange information um, across many different use cases as it were, um, you know, it could be, sharing immunization data it could be you know selling a product uh submitting claims you know there, there's all the, all the different ways that different processes and transactions occur in healthcare it's defined within the fire spec and if we want to add new message formats 
we can add them to the fire spec. You can join HL7 and, and work on that. Um, and, you know, I don't feel that we need to have, like, um, you know, 10,000 different explicit use cases because in healthcare there's, uh, you know, over 100 specialties and hundreds of thousands of uh, procedure codes and, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, so, so, I, so I agree. So here's, here's my concern about use cases. Uh, it, in, in my mind, it's, uh, let's see, how to describe, in, in my mind, what it, what, it, what it feels like sometimes is people say, well, you know, if, if I said here are the, the 10 use cases that we present, uh, I don't want people to, to sort of stop thinking that, well, gee, uh, here are the 10, 10 times, 10 opportunities I would use a blockchain solution and that would be it. And I'm limited to these sort of 10, 10 different sort of examples or 10 different instances where blockchain technologies would be appropriate. Uh, and it, and it kind of shortcuts people's sort of understanding or expectations of the, of the technologies. Uh, now, the flip side of that being, uh, examples are always great to present because it gives some context for the implementation of technologies, particularly newer technologies, so people can kind of understand where the value in the technologies are and are not. Uh, and again, like I said, you know, the, the correlator of that uh, was uh, at the conference, people often ask, well, can't you do this as a central database? And the answer is, yeah, in some cases you certainly could. And so you want to be able to, in this case, underscore the fact that a, a blockchain solution usually is optimal if you're, you know, working across organizations uh, rather than within an, a single organization. And of course, there are obvious examples where that is not necessarily true. But I think uh, I think the value then of of a use case is that it it does present. Uh, good examples uh, so that people can better sort of understand the technology and sort of, uh, you know, see different facets of, of value as implemented. Um, so I, I, I get that. But again, you know, maybe to your point, it, it just, I'm, I'm always a little cautious about it because I don't want to try to limit the discussion to, you know, the five or 10 different options uh, or examples that we present. And that's the only thing that, you know, a hyperledger solution uh, affords. The, the example that I've been using that I think uh, has been helpful in conversations is to say, you know, and this is coming back to the project that we did, but, you know, a patient goes to a doc, goes to the hospital, uh, the hospital for a single visit, you know, they maybe see six different providers that are all contractors. And then, you know, a couple months later, the patient gets six bills from six different uh, organizations and for all for the same visit and the patient ex is extremely confused because they wonder if they've already paid the bill, they have to go to six different websites and follow six different payment processes um, and have six different logins just to pay for that one visit. Obviously right. it's, uh, the US problem, but what, what would be a, if you wanted to think about what would be an ideal state would be that there would be a virtualized uh, single system where I as a patient would only have one set of credentials and as a participant, I would be able to see all of my data across all of those providers and see all my balances in a seamless low friction experience. So the creation of that virtualized one system um, similar to, hey, you know, would it, how would it be if we had to, if we were calling different people in the United States, we'd have to have six different phones, one for each different part of, you know, Bell Telephone, um, because those different uh, organizations didn't speak to each other and were not interoperable. Um, yeah, yeah, but and, and uh, yeah, and exactly. So, so disintermediation is a great example of, you know, of, of how uh, blockchain technologies can sort of solve some, some of the issues there. Hi, uh, this, this is Wendy. Is that okay if I jump in? Yeah, I was just going to open it up to everybody else. So thanks, Wendy. Yeah, um, these are great examples, Brian. Thank you for offering those. I would like to offer kind of a big picture um, op, uh, suggestion for starting, and I'm more than happy to jump in and volunteer to lead this effort if the group would benefit from that. 
I see this as overlapping tremendously with our academic research because a lot of the use cases are being developed and established in academic research. And I wondered if it would make sense to start by just creating a skeleton, basically a list of use cases that have been proposed out there so that we don't try to recreate the wheel and we just kind of consolidate um, just as at a high level, just what are different topics under different categories. And then we as a group decide uh, after we have a chance to evaluate and really incorporate the diverse experience of this group that we pick certain use cases that we feel like have the most potential uh, and the most um, attraction for those organizations that are really looking for a value-added approach. So what do you think about that? That would be fantastic. <laughs> I love volunteers. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'd be happy to facilitate and, and get that spun up. Uh, I, so, so I'd like to hear from others. I, I'm interested to get people's perspectives on, on where the value lies and, and where you know, we, we, we want to maybe avoid areas uh, that maybe don't don't demonstrate uh, value to, to, to purpose. So yeah, about, one of uh, the challenges there's, it's always um, the values in the eye of the beholder. And um, I am aware of about 150 different use cases in healthcare. And some seem more tangible than others. So I wondered if it would make sense to just start listing them and then picking where we want to elaborate. So what do you think about that? Sure, that would be great. Uh, I'd, I'd love to open this up to others. So how about, um, this is Jonathan. So I don't, I don't like the, the, the use case approach. It's more important probably like case studies. Um, my background is in um, healthcare, but also is in medical informatics. And one of the pillars of medical informatics is an ethnographic observation of information flow. So it really is not just throwing out a use case, let's say immunizations. It's really uh, taking that as a case study of where the information is, who holds the information, who are the stakeholders, how is that data modeled, and in this case, really the provenance of the the flow of the information and who there controls it. So I don't like just throwing out a buzzword of oh we're going to put immunizations on the blockchain. It really is taking each of those, and you can create a list. There's lots of lists out there. We're, I'm starting with immunizations as well, but I think that, that, that is kind of like the hello world of healthcare is that when I was in my <laughs> master's degree, it was like I had to build an EHR system and we started off with a, a immunization re or vaccination registry because everyone has one, or at least they should have one. It's decentralized by nature um, and it's, um, you don't get all of that in one place. So it's, and uh, it has to do with identity, it has to do with lot numbers, it has to do with uh, track and trace, et cetera. So I think it's, it's a fascinating starting point the mother's milk is the use case, you know, I've heard about last year. It just, it's so specialized um, that it's not broadly, it can't be um, uh, torn apart and actually broadly applied. Um, so, so, so I just thinking about it more of a case study. And once you actually have a systematic way of tackling it, um, really understanding all the nuances of the information and then see how actually that could be um, generalizable into other use cases. Yeah, very, very good point, Jonathan. Um, so, so this this is useful. And uh, what I'm going to ask is, uh, and again, I'll, I'd be happy to set this up. Uh, Wendy, I'll, I'll sort of put you on point uh, for helping to drive this. Uh, what I'd like to do is is get a meeting together offline uh, with anyone that's interested on on the call. So, if you're interested, uh, let me know, uh, or let Wendy or Jonathan know uh, over on the Rocket Chat channel. Um, and uh, we'll schedule a meeting, uh, and it'll be uh, in the next week or two to, to talk more about this and, and to, to set some direction. Uh, and so, like, as I was talking about before, we have ad hoc teams that we put together for, for dealing with issues like this. So if, if you're on the call and you're interested, uh, please uh, feel free to, to, to let me and, and the others know, and, and we'll move forward from there. Does that sound reasonable, Wendy? That sounds great. I am always um, eager to hear everyone's perspectives and to determine the most efficient approach for moving forward. Awesome. <laughs> and thanks, Jonathan, too, for, for your input. Uh, I suspect uh, you'll probably want to be interested in that conversation uh, and uh, probably uh, Brian as well would be my guess.
Yeah, and and we are. So the immunization use case is actually. So I'm on the IEEE, so the Identity Healthcare Working Group uh, for IEEE. So that's actually our use case, and that's a subgroup within IEEE, the 2418.6 specification. So, so I think it's probably important to have these standards developed across the board. So now it's just out of one standards body, but actually is that we get buy-in from different standards organizations. To, oh, excellent. Yeah, to e even better. Yeah. Yeah, even better to cross pollinize that. Yeah, fantastic. Great, great, good, good, good. Okay. Uh, Richard, yes. Yeah. Hi, Bob Coley. Uh, I'm trying to trying to determine when Benjamin Didi set out a, a a private email back on April 12th, which was a call for project ideas. Uh, is this synonymous with this use case investigatory? Uh, effort or is this something totally separate he's not on the call unfortunately right right so ben uh, so ben's really more interested in uh in looking for use cases within uh, the context of their subgroup for which it tends to be a little bit more patient facing so I, I it's it's very possible that the work that we do out of this ad hoc team uh is a feeder into the patient subgroup uh but right now you know they're really uh, a little more separate uh than 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 not okay all right and and before i forget uh jonathan uh can you contact me through the rocket uh chat uh channel uh because i don't think i have your contact information yep sure thank you uh, and are you local by the way are you in seattle no so i'm in uh, chicago now Oh, okay. so my, it's Jonathan Holt, H-O-L-T. So I'm the founder of Transcendex. And, and are you on LinkedIn? Maybe I can just uh, contact yeah. you through LinkedIn. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, and thanks, Bob, for the comment. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I know Ben is, is trying to look at other use cases uh, for patient uh, subgroup, and so that's kind of uh, been his action. Okay, thank you. Okay, and in, in, in the same sort of general context, the other uh, comment that came out of the HIMSS conference was uh, an interest in blockchain governance. And, uh, and so this, uh, we had a discussion uh, two meetings ago. I ran this up through Hyperledger uh, community leadership and asked them, is anyone doing anything in, in, in this space right now? And the answer was uh, no. Uh, and, you know, our, our in, sort of, broader interpretation of blockchain governance really is, is cross-cutting. So it isn't necessarily specific to the healthcare industry. Uh, it really is uh, gonna apply to just, just about any organization that stands up a blockchain solution uh, and then you know, has, an, has, has a need to understand how to sort of manage it going forward with best practice, practices and so forth. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna color this a little bit, uh, but my sense was, um, this is going to be a lot of heavy lifting, um, but, but uh, in part because um, I don't think the organization really quite has uh, mechanisms in place to make it easy to contact organizations uh, laterally. Um, I mean, w uh, even with our wiki, we just it just seems to be uh, taking a long time to sort of get synced up uh, uh, across uh, across SIGs, uh, and we really haven't worked with the work groups uh, quite yet. Uh, however, that said, I, I think there is value in this. I just wonder if this is something that we want to try to do within the context of this uh, this healthcare SIG. Uh, and uh, of course, if anyone has a real interest and again wants to sort of volunteer uh, the, themselves as a resource, I'm happy again to facilitate, and make introductions, and so forth. Um, anyone want to sort of talk more on this on this particular topic? Oh, and now I've done a horrible job, job and I've, uh, I've frightened everyone. <laughs> so, uh, well, so I, I'm going to say uh, I, I think there's value to this. I think uh, really, I think, and, and this was sort of my recommendation, was we, we may want to spin up a, a, a standalone work group uh, called blockchain governance uh, that is really focused on this again at, at more of a cross cutting or, or sort of you know uh, more lateral uh, has a little more lateral view on this because uh, again this is something that uh, it was brought up uh, in February and w it's a great it's a great story because people are in some ways already accepting of the technologies and they're looking ahead to say well 
three to five years out or, you know, a year, even a year out, how do I, how do I manage this solution in the same way that I manage uh, other technologies that are pretty well established? Again, thinking centralized databases and, and doing updates uh, and uh, CI uh, type uh, activities. Um, and again, you know, what are, what are demonstrated best practices and where are they documented? Um, but again, my sense is that's out of the context for this healthcare group. And I, but, but again, I'd be happy to facilitate if we have people that have a, a, an ex, explicit interest in, in pushing this. Okay, well, so if you happen to, uh, after the fact, feel free to contact me and we'll, we'll continue to push this. Okay, so on a, on a new business, uh, and uh, I'm looking at the time, we've got about 15 minutes. So this is great. So. I'm gonna let Wendy talk a little bit about this, but uh, one of the great things that uh, Wendy brought to the table uh, several weeks ago was uh, a, a list of her sort of private citations that she's been collecting over uh, some period of time. Uh, I sent out a special email about a week ago to, mem to, to membership, and this was to all membership, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, this, this great resource that she's provided. So it's a, a officially now part of our wiki and it is it is vast. Uh, the, in on paper, it's about 97 pages. Of course, uh, a wiki page there is no such notion of that, uh, but it's phenomenal. And so, Wendy, do you want to talk a little bit about this uh, and and more sort of how this came together and how you use it? Oh sure. Um, so this. Uh because I come from academic research and trained as a scientist, I really find value with exploring the academic literature, especially because it has gone through peer review. So many, so much information we find a blockchain on the internet hasn't been scrutinized and hasn't gone through a rigorous review process. But academic research provides another la layer of scrutiny to ensure that the information is more credible. So over time, I had been collecting references in EndNote and then I realized as we had an academic research team um, in this special interest group that it would be valuable to export some of the references that I have. So the way that I created this export is to also include links to where you could find informate where you could find these articles and I noted next to each whether it was open access or whether, you, whether it required a subscription to review. Anytime that a reference required a subscription, I also looked to see if it was posted somewhere else as open access, so that you could click on the subscription information, which contains all the details that you would need to download the reference if you liked it, um, but otherwise you could access the article for free. And I provided an abstract so that there were more key terms so that if you were looking for a particular topic, you could just do keyword searches and see which articles seem to mention that topic. And then you could click on the link to access that information. So I cannot provide the subscription only articles to the larger group for copyright due to copyright restrictions, but if anyone absolutely loved an article and they just couldn't access it, send me a private email and I can provide it to one individual. So um, just I hope that this is um, a helpful resource and I plan on updating it uh, approximately every month. And Rich and I are still working on figuring out how to best update the website. So <laughs> more to come. So so excellent. Uh, uh, thank you for that, Wendy. I mean, this really is a phenomenal resource. Uh, it, it really is an amazing uh, document. And thanks again, Wendy. So, uh, so that does remind me. Uh, so if anyone uh, is on the call that is familiar with Confluence, uh, it, as it turns out, there does not appear to be a direct way to import a Word document, a Microsoft Word document, into Confluence, or Confluence without losing formatting. And that's really key because, again, uh, Wendy's do, uh, original Word document, which is, uh, we're, we're going to use her document, which is offline as a single source of truth, which means as she ups, updates it, uh, on, a, on we're hoping about a monthly basis, it'd be great if we could do it more often, but we need a, a workflow for this. Uh, we need to be able to import these uh, with zero friction or near zero friction. And at the moment, 
Uh, there is apparently no way to do this. Um, and I've been working with uh, Hyperledger community um, leadership uh, to see if there are plugins that are available. And there used to be a plugin, as we understand it, but there doesn't appear to be a plugin uh, that allows us to do that. So anyone has ideas, let me know. Rich, Rich, this is Ravish. Yeah. Just a quick um, thought. Um, if, if you save the document as HTML, um, the, the, you, you will not get a Word document field, but it, it'll just flow. And if there are links in the document that works, you can import the HTML into Confluence. Yeah, and I've done that. And the issue that we have is uh, horizontal lines, even in HTML, uh, don't, don't get carried into Confluence. And as it turns out, we exercise that particular issue in this document, uh, which, which is really uh, ends up being a high cost issue. Uh, it's, it's about a 20 minutes or so to, to reintroduce those horizontal lines. But uh, Ravish, let's take this offline uh, and, and yeah. talk more uh, only because, uh, yeah, this is a big deal and I'd love to find yeah, If you can send me a sample document, I can try and I can send the directions. Sure. In fact, Wendy, can can I have you uh, just email that to, that document to Ravish? Would that be okay? Abs absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if I have Ravish's contact information, so maybe we can just exchange that offline. Sure. I'll I'll I'll, I'll make introductions. Okay. Um, so I, I'm just mindful of time. We about to have about ten minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward uh, pretty quickly here. So, uh, so every so often we have uh, opportunities in the healthcare space that come up that present us with very interesting opportunities, collaborate uh, and, uh, and, and uh, work as a team or as teams, plural. Uh, so if anyone uh, is familiar with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, they tend to fund a lot of uh, socially uh, sort of facing uh, challenge opportunities. Uh, there was one that uh, I participated in a couple of years ago. Uh, and so we have two opportunities that, that are just opening up at the end of this month, so about 10 days from now. Uh, one is social determinants of healthcare, uh, the innovation challenge for that, and then the other is the home and community-based care innovation challenge. So, uh, so I've provided links in the agenda, uh, and feel free to walk through here. Uh, there's sort of the, the, the statement for, for this particular challenge. Uh, and I want you to think in terms of blockchain solutions, of course. And then for the home base innovation, uh, and here's, here's sort of the, the challenge uh, sort of uh, thesis here. Uh, and I see Alan Bachman on the call. And we, we just did a, a, a Kidney X challenge uh, courtesy of Alan and uh, CVS Health. Uh, about a month or so ago. So again, this may be something that we may want to think about. Uh, and, and my background's in kidney care, and so I'm looking at this and going, well, we can maybe do something with blockchain technologies in kidney care. So anyway, so I, I, I'd really like you to, uh, to think uh, sort of long and hard about these two opportunities. Uh, and again, imagine from your perspective that we have over a thousand uh, resources potentially available who would want to participate in something like this. And so um, uh, it is, uh, as is the case for a lot of these challenges, it's a very, very short window uh, of opportunity, about a month to, to put something together. The deliverable, I believe, on both of these uh, is, a, uh, is a very short uh, statement document. And then I think 10 pages, up to 10 pages of slides uh, and a, a wireframe sort of prototype of the solution. So, so the deliverable is reasonable uh, for that one month sort of turnaround, uh, but of course you'd have to really be you know, moving along uh, with some velocity sort of quickly to put together a solution. So it's, it's a bit early. I'm thinking out what I'm gonna do is I'll generate a, uh, uh, an email to introduce this to full membership, and then we'll sort of uh, coalesce some teams around these two points. Uh, but what I'd ask is, uh, since this is a, a very quick sort of um, uh, 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 introduction, uh, I think I learned about this maybe last night is when the email went out or when I saw it. Uh, we, we do want to sort of try to operate uh, quickly and, and see if, if there's, there are people that are interested in moving forward on this. Okay, and, uh, and then finally, uh, and we have Brian on the call, and I'll, I'll let Brian speak for, for a, a little while. Uh, we, we've got about five minutes left on the call. 
Uh, Brian will be presenting uh, next uh, uh, general meeting, which is May 3rd. Uh, and he's from Instamed, and uh, I'll just sort of point out Instamed. There's their website, and uh, they're working on uh, some solutions. Uh, what's really great about it, and this is going to be the real incentive for people to, to go play, they actually have a demo that's up and running. And so uh, I'll let Brian speak a little bit more about his presentation uh, at our next meeting. Thanks, Rich. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I wanted to quickly say, uh, Jonathan, I, I loved your comments. Um, we wanted to take a, a similar approach of building something that is uh, more generalized, um, that's more generic, um, and we open sourced our code. Uh, we implemented, I even translated all of the HL7 Fire um, resources, including the clinical ones, um, to the Hyperledger, Node.js, SDK, and Convector uh, TypeScript model. So it would be very easy for anyone to build on top of what we built and just implement other, uh, other flows uh, as defined by HL7 Fire. But uh, the specific aspects of HL7 Fire that we implemented on Hyperledger Fabric included, uh, you know, trying to, included the financial management workflow part of fire if anyone is familiar with it and uh, to specifically to solve the um, the problem that I mentioned earlier where as a patient you know I the majority of bills that are being sent to patients are done via paper and then when the patients are paying those bills they tend to pay them by you know mailing a check in yet still sometimes they pay online but it's it's very inefficient um, over $400 billion a year comes from patients in the U.S. market alone. And the fact that it's so difficult and expensive to collect from patients, you know, is a huge burden uh, of inefficiency on the market. Um, and then, you know, a couple other big ideas that I thought about while implementing this um, is that Instamed is a clearinghouse, uh, but we are focused on uh, healthcare payments. I'm thinking about this as Clearinghouse 2.0, that if organizations wanted to host their own node and be a member, they could, uh, or they could go through another member um, and just be a participant. But this is not too dissimilar from what Clearinghouses do. Um, but in Clearinghouse 2.0, in addition to just being able to support the claims and remittances uh, and eligibilities and a few other of the HIPAA transactions, um, you know, it would be being able to support a much broader set of data exchange. Um, and I also think about this, I've been thinking about Hyperledger Fabric um, as something more about interoperability and the, uh, it's kind of like the TCP IP protocol. Nobody should own the TCP IP protocol. Um, if, what would the internet look like if companies tried to own their own protocol? You know, we might have 10 different internets, you know, or 100 different internets. Um, you know, this, my thinking is that we, we did this work in an open space and made it open source so that anybody could use it. Um, we're not saying we, we don't own it. Uh, we're trying to become a Hyperledger Labs project I met with uh, David Boswell uh, yesterday to talk about it. And we're also talking to HL7 Fire and, um, you know, trying to ask them to make a few enhancements and add new resources to the specification. Um, and we're trying to get a working meeting at the September uh, working group meeting in Atlanta to have a, a conversation about interoperability and blockchain. Uh, because right now, you know, OAuth is great. It allows, you know, you to use your credentials from a third-party application, but it still doesn't solve the problem that if I go to six different doctors, now I have six sets of credentials. Um, and so we need some sort of single sign-on, you know, some way to be able to access all of our data across multiple providers to create that layer of abstraction while still maintaining HIPAA compliance and security. So, uh, 
and, you know, those and, are some of the ideas, yeah. And you'll you'll be sort of focused on this uh, this discussion in your in your presentation uh, at the next meeting. Correct. So I will be demoing, uh, go taking a look at our open source repository, uh, demoing our application, and then um, talking about the big vision of you know what what are some possible things we could do with this code base and move the ball forward. Um, you know next steps because the purpose of this was not to just solve our one problem. I took this opportunity to come up with a generalized solution that other people can just carry forward and start working and cut down on the work that they need to do to implement their use case. Um, all you have to do is, hey, uh, go to the fire spec, you know, pick the resources that you need. They're already been translated for you. Implement a few of the controller methods. Uh, we have instructions on how to deploy it and you're done. Literally, you could probably get it, uh, implement your a use case as, as it were, you know, in a few days um, because we've done all this heavy lifting for you. Excellent. Well, good. So, so this is a great intro to, uh, to our next meeting and a great segue uh, to sort of close out this week's meeting. Uh, we're at the very top of the hour. So thanks, everybody. And uh, stay tuned for in two weeks. And Brian will be talking about uh, their, their open source solution using Hyperledger Fabric and Instamed. So with that, uh, it'd be great to say thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Beth.